Welcome to Work Life by Design. I'm your host, Mel Marsden. In a time when we can work from anywhere, why is it that we actually need to go to work to work? You're about to hear how organisations have optimised their business by shifting employee and business mindsets from slow, stagnant operations to agile and flexible environments, establish premium levels of employee experience and realised substantial profits. You'll be inspired by stories of transformation, exploring everything from organisational psychology to brand and identifying opportunities that exist in your workplace environment to inspire your human potential. As a passionate entrepreneur with a desire to create places where both people and business thrive, my sole focus is to inspire you to find your place at work and in life so you can live a life by design. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Work Life by Design. This week's episode is a little bit different to our regular programming. In today's episode, I'm actually being interviewed by Amanda Bulow from the Awesome Women podcast. And I thought I'd share this one with you here because it was quite a fun little interview and we talked about everything to do with workplace design, how our workplaces have evolved, the different types of typologies and space settings that we have in our workplace environments. We even go into the debate of is the open plan office dead and what we might be expecting to see in our workplaces in a post-COVID world. We also take a dive into my career history and have a little bit of a look at how I came to be an interior designer and the founder and director of Community. I also even share some of my tips and thoughts on what it takes to run a successful business and what I wish I'd known when I first started out. I do hope that you enjoy this episode and if you are loving the podcast, I would really appreciate it if you would leave us a review and drop a rating in iTunes. It helps other people find the podcast as well. But for now, let's jump in with the lovely Amanda from the Awesome Women podcast as she interviews me on what it takes to be a designer and how our workplace environments are transitioning into the future. Hi everybody, well it's time for another Awesome Women podcast and today we have Melissa with us who's the founder and director of Community. Hi Melissa. Hello and thank you for having me on the show. Not a problem. So Melissa is a workplace dynamics strategist who works with corporate and professional service firms to create physical environments that drive high performance teams. Oh my god, how cool is that? (laughs) <laughs> so give us a little more on that, you know, Melissa, does that mean that the open plan office that we've all just gotten used to is no more? Well, I think to start with, what we do is we actually work with organisations to help them understand how the people within their organisation actually work. And that's where the dynamics piece comes in. It's by unpacking their organisation to figure out who works there, what they do, how they interact, what type of personalities they are what their roles and responsibilities are, and then rebuilding an environment around that that enables them to actually perform. So it gives them the tools that they need, the spaces that they require to actually come to work and to thrive because they've got everything they need to actually do their job. From the perspective of the open plan, I'm a bit of a bugbearer about this one because everyone goes, oh, I hate open plan, I hate this, I hate that. I think open plan has got a really bad rap because it went from such an extreme of being this traditional closed office environment to everyone being thrown out into workstations without the support spaces to enable those private conversations or anywhere for some sort of privacy to occur. So I think workplaces have evolved over the last few years to move away from open plan to being a more balanced interaction, having other spaces for people to be able to utilise and engage in. We talk about it in terms of three typologies. You used to have your office, your meeting room and your desk. That was it. But we've shifted a lot more since then and we're introducing more and more of those spaces. So the term open plan can be quite expansive and can encompass quite a few things. So it just really gets down to the nitty gritty of of what is open plan and what is everyone's individual experience of it. And I think you're right in the sense that open plan has been taken too far. There were times when you just needed to have those conversations that no one else could hear the only place in a lot of businesses I worked in was to go into the boardroom or to go outside into the car park and you know there's distractions and noises and again you still had to be conscious of the conversation that you were having 
Yeah, very much so. And I think what's happened over time is organisations felt that, well, you're here to do your job. You can do that at your desk. Why do you need to have privacy and all of those places to have private conversations? And I think there used to be this persona that if you weren't at your desk, you weren't working. I think those days are well and truly long gone. Our work lives have been so interwoven now that we need to be able to take care of some of our personal life at work because we're definitely taking our work home with us. So there needs to be flexibility. And I was just going to say, you know, if we can't take those odd personal calls at work, then we shouldn't be taking the phone home with us you know we should be leaving it in the top drawer and we all know that that's not a reality either so what are some of the new areas you know you mentioned that you go into workplaces and do an assessment or have a look and see who's working there but what are some of these new spaces that are coming out what we're starting to see with the organizations that we're working with is when we're unpacking them actually requiring a much broader range of spaces to be able to service all of the needs that they have within the business so there's five or six sort of typologies that we work with you so you've got your general work zones which are typically your office or your workstation those are there but the ratio of those provided into the work environment does tend to change the ancillary spaces that sit around that so we need collaboration spaces a lot more and this also depends on the type of the organization so when we go and we work with potentially an accounting or a legal company they're going to have far less of those collaboration spaces in contrast you've got someone like a software engineering company who are mobile brainstorming they're you know up interacting quite a bit so they're going to need a lot more of those collaboration spaces But even in that collaboration space, what style of collaboration is it? Is it with a screen? Is it with a whiteboard? Is it sitting around a lounge and brainstorming? Is it sitting around a meeting table? We've then also got lounging spaces, so places that people can go and sit down and read a document, have a coffee, and do so in a different zone that isn't at your work point. So just something to sort of shift up that mental energy throughout the day as well. You've also then got your bump spaces. So they're the areas that are like hotspots within your organisation to help bring people together. It's those serendipitous interactions. So you'll find cafes within or kitchen spaces within our businesses. The print zone is also another really hotspot. So they're the spaces that we'll sort of bump into each other. We have conversations with different departments and different people that we previously may not had much interaction with. We're also seeing a lot more standing spaces. So whether that's sit to stand workstations or fixed height standing desks or standing collaboration spaces, we're seeing a lot more of that because it's encouraging that incidental exercise to happen within our premises. So encouraging our people to be a bit more healthy and conscious of their own well-being. The last space that we're seeing a lot more of is those quiet spaces. So again, those quiet spaces could take on the form of a quiet room. So somewhere that I can go and take that private phone call, jump on a webinar, do a, a Zoom call. Or it could just be a communal quiet space. So maybe it's a library zone. So there's a written rule that we all don't take our phone in there. We don't speak in there. And it's somewhere that I can go and I can relax and I can just kind of chill out for a while and I can work in a quiet environment without being closed away in a box. So they're the types of zones that we're starting to see come through. And But as I said, within them, there's quite a lot of variance that you do see with that as well. Let's say that we all work an eight-hour day. I know that's not necessarily how it happens, but we can't be performing at that peak for eight hours. Like it's just, we're going to crush and burn. And it's great that there's these quiet spaces even because, you know, after you've had that meeting about a $34 million tender or you might have had a phone call with a customer who's irate about a situation, not so much yourself, sometimes if you go and just take that 10 or 15 minutes with a coffee just to take that time out, then you can recharge, I guess, for the rest of the day if that's ahead of you rather than stewing on that phone call that you had at 8 o'clock or 8.30 in the morning and it sets the tone for the rest of the day. Absolutely. And I'm seeing that more and more within our organisations, the introduction of wellness and multi-purpose spaces. So it's somewhere I can just go and lock myself away for five, 10 minutes, regroup. If we can encourage that kind of behaviour to happen within the environment and it's actually constructed to support that, I think that the health and wellbeing of our employees is going to be elevated in, in our work environments by actually acknowledging that that is a need and then providing for that. Absolutely. Instead of just, you know, constantly trying to get more and more and put that, you know, constant push and and nose to the grindstone type of thing. Yeah, mental health of our staff and ourselves is something that we, it's the conversation is happening more and more, which is great to see. Yeah. And those spaces need to feel different to the rest of the environment as well. You know, our workplaces are those high productive, high energy zones. So this needs to have the ability for you to be able to take it down a few notches. So dim lighting, 
softer carpets, you know, more residential style furnishings in there as well, perhaps some plants, some nice lighting. Those sorts of things help to kind of create that calming environment and whether there's smell and scents in there as well. All of these things help with all of our sensory stimulation so that we can actually help bring that emotional level down. Yeah, I like it. I like it. With, I guess, taking some of those workspaces into consideration and the work environments that we've had over the last few months with COVID, many of us have been working from home five days a week. And on some level, we, you know, need to make sure that we're having those different spaces and zones at home as well. Are we going to take some of these positives out of what we've been doing over the last few months? I certainly hope so. Some of the work that we were doing through the early stages of COVID were we did some training programs around how people could actually use their whole home and replicate those sorts of environments that we create in our corporate workplaces within our home. So thinking about the activity and the task that we do each and every moment throughout our day and how we can then align that back to our home environment. So if you can set up a home office, fantastic. And then that's kind of like your general working zone. But we highly encourage people not to sit there all day because when we're sitting at home in our general work environment all day, we're staring at a screen. We're not physically moving between meetings. We're not getting up. We're not going to the photocopier. We're not going to have a chat with a colleague. Everything's happening on a screen. So we're physically planted to a chair all day. And that's really unhealthy for us as well. Thinking about it in terms of those five zones I mentioned. So if you need to do a standing style working or a meeting, go and use the kitchen bench because it's at that elevated height, prop your laptop up and you can work there. Perhaps you can do a team meeting call there rather than actually staying at your desk. If you're going to be reading a document or you've got some quieter work to do, go and sit in the lounge room and do that. I even encourage people to use their bedroom. I know most people go, don't use your bedroom for working, but if you're using it for the right style of energy that you want to bring to the task that you've got to do, then I think it's perfect. I love sitting on my bed cross-legged with all my stuff spread out. I find it the most creative space for me to kind of get into that zone and just sort of have that free thinking. So I think it's about finding what's going to work for you, thinking about the types of activities you need to do and their mental energy you need to bring to them. And then kind of pairing that with the different spaces within your home to help you shift up your day and get some of that incidental exercise in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what works for yourself might work differently for me and would work differently for Sally in the office too. And we've also seen as well that some people are thriving working from home. Other people are missing that separation of work and home you know everyone's working differently and I think the last few months have definitely highlighted that as well I completely agree with that and I think some people are more hardwired to work individually and independently than others and again it comes down to that personality style am I an introvert or am I an extrovert even with that I think the social and human connection is really really important so our workplaces have provided that for us but I think the other thing that does come with this is some people really enjoy structure and routine and our workplace environments really support us to be able to provide that and they also guide us through how we are actually to behave every single day the way that our workplaces are designed and most people don't quite understand this and it wasn't until they're been taken away from us and all of a sudden we had to figure out how to get out of bed in the morning and find ourselves to our computer to you know start working at nine o'clock We didn't really understand the mental routine that we go through in terms of getting up, getting dressed, getting ready to go to work, commuting to work, arriving in our building, transitioning through the stages of our building to find our desk. There's actually a really big process in that that mentally primes us and prepares us for our working day. And so when we're working at home, we don't have that. And it would be the same coming home. You know, you don't have that 45-minute or hour commute or even 10-minute commute to listen to your favourite music turned up or have a laugh at whatever's being said on the radio and disconnecting from that workspace too, being able to walk in your home and go, yep, right, I'm home now, let's do what we need to do here, where you're just walking out of one room and into the kitchen. You don't have that disconnect. No, so it's about creating a new routine of how you set up your work day and how you close your work day. Some people go for a walk on the beach if they're lucky enough to live in that sort of space or they take the dog for a walk. For me, it's a shut down, clean up, go have a shower and change into my PJs because then that's it, work's done. Sometimes that works for me and sometimes I've just got crack loads to do and the day keeps going. So it's a transition. And again, it's identifying what works for you. You know, some people I've had just simply, you know, reversing the car out of the driveway, doing a block, And then coming home gives them that same sense of driving to work. And if that's what works, go for it. Yeah. To your point earlier about people being able to enjoy being at home with the kids, maybe that's the closing out of the day for you. It's like, okay, we're just going to go to the park and kick the ball around for half an hour. And that's that separation time to try and 
distinguish and close out that day from a work day back into your personal life. Absolutely. So with your career, I guess, Melissa, let's have a quick chat about that. And, you know, being the founder and director of communities, were you always working towards this or do we have another lifestyle and another career pre this? How did you get to where you are now? I've always known I wanted to have my own business and I've always been interested in design. And so when I left high school, I went off to become a graphic designer, actually. Started at university at Griffith and the first year is a three-strand year. You learn industrial design, interior design and graphic design. And at the end of the first year, you have to decide. And I just looked at it from the first year and went, if I have to design logos for the rest of my life, I will shoot myself. (laughs) So I went, I'm going to go down this interior design path. That looks cool. I worked three jobs while I was getting myself through uni and jumped into my career. And I'm really fortunate because I was able to progress quite quickly through my career and I became a national director of a previous design and project management company. I left that because I wasn't quite feeling satisfied in all levels of my life. Inadvertently, community got started. At the time, it was Marsden Collective. and We rebranded about two years ago now, but it came about because I left and went, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll just kind of go where the wind takes me. And I had three clients come to me and say, let's get started. I want to do these projects with you. And I said, okay, well, great. And off we went from there. So we turned seven this month. So it's just, um, yeah, thank you. So it's been a really interesting journey, but I've always wanted to have my own business. I find it difficult to try and take orders from other people. So (laughs) that's the reason we're here. And I like being able to kind of control my own destiny. So that's how that's all kind of come together. But very happy to have made it seven years in business now and still be standing, particularly after COVID. Yeah, I guess COVID's taught us all sorts of different things too with business. I know from an AWIC point of view, it was all about making sure we were there to support our community, but also making sure that we were still visual during that time, you know, that we may not be having events, but we definitely increased our presence through virtual events and those sorts of things. We kept in front of it, I guess, for lack of a better word, but it's definitely taught us lots of new things about marketing and how to get through diversity. And Yeah, I would agree with that. We ramped up our social presence as well through this time. And we also introduced a Facebook Live every week and created a community for us to be able to have a conversation. So we started the Facebook group Community Dialogue mm-hmm. so that we could encourage our clients to come in and join us. Early on, it was a really great platform because we started to talk about some of these things around rituals and routines and adaption and you know how we all kind of getting on. And so that was a really great space for us to be able to have those conversations. And now that we're starting to transition back into the workplace, the conversations are sort of starting to shift as well. And we're starting to talk about more factual things like lease terms and all of the the really important things that come with designing a new workplace. Yeah. So... I want to have a quick chat to you about our next generation. From an AWIC point of view, we've been working with TAFE Queensland and part of that conversation was that we wanted to let kids that are or students that are in grades 10, 11, 12 know that there's this whole world out there that's waiting for them. You know, construction isn't just about dirty trucks and tool belts. Like yourself, if you've got a flair for colour and being able to match pinks and purples and polka dots and stripes, then there's this amazing career waiting for you as an interior designer. If you are a facts and figures type of person and you want to be an accountant, have a think about maybe specialising in the construction industry. And we wanted to highlight those possibilities. Is it something we need to be embracing our next gen? Do they have a whole other level of skill sets that they can bring to our business that we aren't aware of? Look, I think the next generation are going to definitely bring a new challenge to our businesses because if you look at the way that our education system is bringing people through it, the types of schools that are being designed now, they're kind of agile environments for education. Universities have been dealing with this for years. You know, even when I went to uni, you were in charge of your own timetable and making sure that you delivered your or assessment pieces and then we go into the workforce and all of a sudden we're stuck in a cubicle and told to show up from nine to five and this is what you need to do and a lot of that has become that command and control style leadership over outcomes-based productivity and our universities are designed around outcomes-based productivity so I think we're starting to see that shift in our workplaces and it's about having to have to trust the people that we're employing to be able to do the job to the skill level that we need them to do it 
Having said that, with the new graduates and things that will be coming into the industry, there's a level of learning that just happens by presence. And I like to call it by osmosis. And workplaces are fantastic places for that because if you sit around a bunch of people who are quite experienced in what they do, you will learn by overhearing conversations, asking questions, and just being in a general environment with other people who have been doing this for quite a period of time. So there's that element that is going to be challenged particularly with organisations that are going to go to a far more flexible work environment. And there will need to be far more structure put in place in order to ensure that the skill sets are being transferred to those graduates as they come in. And I think you're right there in terms of the high school students that we've got at the moment. You know, they're very tech savvy. They're all over this stuff. They've just had to do homeschooling for the last, you know, six plus weeks as well. So, they're quite agile and adaptable individuals and it's now going to be a challenge for us as businesses, as managers and as leaders to be able to orientate them into our businesses and ensure that we're communicating not only our culture so that they're actually understanding who they're working for and particularly if they're in that remote style environment but also then what their skill sets uplift are going to be over that period of time and how that happens. Yeah, if we don't encourage it when they come into our workplaces, I think they're going to quickly turn around and go, you know what, this place isn't for me. And we need that injection, that new blood into our workplaces. I was actually chatting with a client the other day and he was saying, you know, they've onboarded someone through COVID and they've never met this person face to face and they've never been within their office. And so they've got a perception now about what the culture of that organisation is and whether or not they still fit within that organisation as they now all coming back into the office. So I think our structures around onboarding and culture, how we're radiating that and, you know, encouraging all of our teams to happen and engage with that on a a technological and a, a virtual level it's going to be really interesting for us going forward because it's not something that we've, as organisations, put a lot of energy into in the past. No, because many of them in the construction industry as a whole, if the flexibility isn't available because, you know, you don't get the same productivity if you're working from home. There's a level of trust that's not there. And all of a sudden we've come out of COVID or during COVID and it's been working fine. Productivity is still happening. Jobs are still getting to site. And it's about us having a, a reflective look on that, I think. And it's definitely been an opportunity where... We take the positives out of the situation and go, you know what, this has worked. And do we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater at the end of it? Uh, Look, I actually was secretly very happy about COVID in a very morbid kind of way. (laughs) (laughs) There's been many quotes that have come around and said, you know, COVID did overnight what change programs take 18 months to achieve. And it's all about mindset and perception. And we have the technology, we have the ability. It's about us being able to accept that that's the way things are going to be and and work with it and lo and behold it's possible so you've all survived yeah that's it that's I think a very positive it's been able to really shake up the system around how we work and how we need to work and how we think we work a new beginning in terms of what we can expect from our workplaces moving forward the shame that I think would be is if we do go back to just going oh well we'll just pick up business as usual we'll we'll do things the way we've always done them because that's just what we do rather than taking this opportunity to reflect and identify what's actually really working what's been good for people and then setting up a new standard going forward yeah I agree I think I'm hoping that we can keep a hold of some of those really valued and amazing changes and like you said you know it's happened overnight but I think it definitely has a lot of positivity there and we just need to hold on to that and move forward. Totally agree. So Melissa give us three tips anybody who's out there listening who might be thinking about starting their own business what would you be saying to them at the moment? Oh, um, some of the things that I wish I'd known when I first started my business was around being really clear on your purpose, understanding why you're getting into business in the first place and being super, super clear on that because, you know, you are going to encounter tough times. There's going to be challenges, whether that's with the industry, your team, your clients, you know, there, there's going to be tough times and being able to get yourself through those means that you have to have a really strong foundation in terms of why you're actually doing this because it's quite as give up otherwise. The thoughts crossed my mind a couple of times as well, given what's been going on, but 
I'm here to do something a lot more than this. So that's why I keep going. I think the other thing is being really clear on your own values. And this is something I've spoken about a little bit in the past. When you're clear on what you stand for and why you do what you do, it's much easier to make decisions. And earlier on in my career, I wasn't very clear on those things. So I would kind of just go with the flow and I didn't really have my own opinion. But a lot of that stuff didn't sit well with me and that's why I had some of those changes in my career. And now I know exactly what's important to me. I know exactly what it is that we want to be achieving and that helps me make those decisions as I move forward from a values perspective. And the third thing that I have learned, which has been probably one of my toughest lessons to learn, is that no one is going to care about your business as much as you do. And that's okay because it's not their business, but it's about managing your expectations so that everyone is still very happy and comfortable and we're all doing this together, but it's at their level as opposed to what your level is. You're the owner of the business, that's your responsibility and that's how you kind of need to manage through. So just being really conscious that you're the one who's going to give the biggest shit at the end of the day. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely agree, 100%. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. It's been great to have a chat with you and to find out about all of the new open spaces. And and I guess it gives us all something to have a think about when we head back into the office, if we head back into the office. Um, So, Melissa, what's the best way people can reach out to you if they're listening and they want you to come and have a look at their workplaces and see what sort of dynamics you can bring to their place of business? The best way to get in touch with me would be send me an email and you can do that at Melissa at community and that's spelled c-o-m-u-n-i-t-i dot com dot au if you shoot me an email and i'll get back to you fantastic thank you for your time melissa and uh, everybody listening have a great day thanks very much amanda thank you for joining me for work life by design if you enjoyed this episode i'd love you to rate review or subscribe or all three in itunes and share it with your friends so we can continue to build this community i would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts questions or suggestions you can connect with me on instagram at melma or send me an email at melissa at melissamarsden.com.au i hope this episode has given you a few sparks of inspiration so you can design a work life you love